Dave Bond, thank you. Okay. So we've had the feedback, yes. Mike's working. Mike is working. Yes. Well, once again, welcome. Welcome. Um, did you see an angel today? I, I know there was an angel today here at camp. I know there was an angel on, on Friday, on Sabbath when I arrived because my caravan was up. And God told that angel, Edward is running late, and you put his caravan up, otherwise he's going to really be like, really be struggling and not, not be able to think. And today, God told another angel, Edward is very, very harassed. Edward is very nervous about today's speech. He's not thinking properly. He hasn't put his towel on properly. His towel, towel is going to fly all over the place. Would you mind just clipping it up? On and somebody answered his call and said, Yes, Father, I'll do that for him. So, to my angel, who responded to God's grace, thank you very much. I saw an angel clipping a towel. Did you? <laughs> well, I'm not going to say that. That's okay. But have, have you guys seen a blessing? Have you guys seen somebody do something? That's been inspired by God to do that for you or to do that for somebody else. And that's why we are here. I had angels delivering that name to my caravan. <laughs> <laughs> it's just manna from heaven. Mary Angels brought Daniel. Yes. It just goes to show angels don't know how to they don't know how it tastes. Lester wants to know if anyone wants two cartons of nut meat, by the way. <laughs> so I, I, I just pray that as you walk around this week, that you will see God's love for you in the things other people do. You know, we are God's hands here. We are God's hands at home. But here... It is magnified because of the time. Um, and when you see that, just praise God. Lord, you put this idea, you impress my brother and my sister to do this. And they responded, I oh, thank you for that. And I pray that we will see more and more of that as we walk, walk around the grounds. And we'll stay here longer. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you once again for, for bringing us here tonight. Thank you for sheltering us um, during the storm. We thank you that um, nothing serious happened, Lord. We praise you for bringing bring Laurel and Daniel here to arrive just before the storm struck, Lord. Um, and your mercy in bringing them here safely. Lord, I pray that as we um, gather here tonight um, and we will do this study, Lord, that um, your thoughts and your words will come through. That you will hide me behind the cross, Lord. That it will not be me who speaks, but it will be you. Um, and that we will have a better understanding of who you are. And if we already know and have a good understanding of who you are, Lord, may this just strengthen that bond um, on the character of God. Thank you and pray for your presence. May you keep us hedged in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so just from my just from my um, point of view, I have a memory like a sieve. So I just thought we would we would go back through a few things that we looked at on, on Saturday night. Um, we looked at a few things on Saturday night on, on the nature and the character of God. Um, and it was an introduction really to what's coming over the next presentations. Um, there's four presentations, um, and we. We, we pray that by the end of the fourth presentation, at least some of the questions that we had might have been answered. Um, if not, maybe we've got a new foundation or, or we've got a platform to look at. Uh, we looked at, and I've got, to, I've got to praise the Lord for Lester and for Craig and for Colin and, and, and both Craigs. Um, you might know, not know this, but a few months ago the elders got together and we said, okay, let's, we're going to do a presentation. What are we going to present? And all we said, well, you've got this time, you've got that time, you've got this time, you've got that time. And everybody was really allowed to pick whatever topic that the Lord had impressed them with. 
Um, and everybody seems to be impressed with the same thing. The same thing. Seems to be the, the theme of, 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 of tabernacles. Um, there must be a reason for it. God doesn't do anything for, um, what, by half or, or by mistake. So I really enjoyed Craig this morning. Really had my eyes to, my eyes to a few things that, that I, I had spoken about on Saturday night. And Lester, same with yours. I was really, really impressed and enjoyed it. Um, so the, we, we said a few things about the law of God. Um, we gave two quotes. One of the quotes was from Ellen G. White. Ellen White said, His law is the transcript of his character and is the standard of all character. So his law, his character is the standard of all character. Um, Jones said that the Ten Commandments is but the expression in writing a transcript of the character of him who sits upon the throne. And who's he who sits upon the throne? God. Um, we also said that um, the law was perfect. And God was perfect. Um, because it's a transcript of his character. And God, he, did God, why did God keep the law? It's who he is. He doesn't keep it because he wants to, doesn't keep it because he needs to. The law is who he is. If he behaved any other way, there's only two things that, that would mean. It would mean that he would have to change who he actually was. And we looked at several Bible verses who said that God cannot change. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Another thing that could that could occur, though it, it can't occur because it's, it's a manuscript of, of his character, um, it would mean that the law would have to be modified or could be modified to changing conditions. But we, when we read Exodus 20, uh, we see that there is a law and there's no subparagraphs. There's no section 2 or section 3. It doesn't say, thou shall not commit adultery unless your wife does first. Or thou shall not be a fault witness against your neighbour, unless he's a really bad guy, then you can be a fault witness. So none of the Ten Commandments have a sub-paragraph or sub-clause to them, except when it seems to come to Exodus 20, verse 13. Verse 13 Thou shalt not kill, unless, unless you reject every single bit of mercy that I'm going to give you, and when you reject that, then I can kill you. Subparagraph one. There, there is no subparagraph. Thou shalt not kill. The other thing we looked at was that if, if the law was the manuscript of God's character, then Christ was a visual demonstration of God's character. And as Craig very um, eloquently put it this morning, there was never a time that Christ did not know what his father was like. He always knew what his father was like. From the very beginning, the very beginning of what? Eternity. Eternity. As, far as, as far back as you want to know. Christ observed his Father. Not only did Christ observe his Father, all the creation observed the Father. And at no time did the Father come out of character. They saw constancy. He was constant in everything he did. If there was a variance in him, then there would have been a variance in Christ. But there was no variance in Christ. Everything we see in Christ is what, Christ, what God the Father is. Um, and we saw that in his ministry here on earth. So, this worked fine before the fall. This law worked fine before the fall. There was no question that God's law was the only way to live. God's system proved to be absolute. Absolute happiness, security, fulfillment to all of God's creatures. No situation ever arose which needed a demonstration of force to be considered. But then there was one who needed the law changed. He needed the law changed. He wanted the law changed. He needed the law to be questioned, to be modified, so he could impart his character on creation. So he can impart his system, so he can impart his ambitions. So he set forward a plan to change the character of God in the eyes of his creation. So the universe looks on and looked on. They're looking on in interest. 
Would God's principle, would God's character, would he continue to operate exactly the same way, the same loving, the same protective way he had always been from eternity? Or would he need to modify, would he need to change, would he need to change the law or himself to deal with this new threat? Would he be compelled to deal with the sin problem by exercise, exercising his unlimited power to destroy the wrongdoer who had refused every opportunity for mercy? And that's why we left it. I'm going to read you a few quotes from Ellen White. Boy, I, like, I love technology. <clears throat> Quote number one. This is Lucifer. He is determined that he will be master. When in heaven, he said, what need have the angels of any law? <coughs> Why hast thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Because he wanted to be equal with Christ. And when he fell, he brought many of the angels with him. They took his side. The enemy is working just as sharply and decidedly now as he worked upon the minds of Adam and Eve in Eden. The people are gathering under his banner. He is encircling them with his power. But everyone that sees that the law of God is changeless in his character will decide on the side of Christ. If God could have changed one precept of his law to meet fallen man, then Jesus Christ did not have come to, our, to earth to die. He began to ins insinuate doubts concerning the law that governed heavenly beings, laws that he declared were arbitrary, detrimental to the interest of the heavenly universe, and in need of change. Vital interests were at stake. Would Lucifer succeed in underdoing confidence in God's law? Would he make so apparent those, those, those supposed, supposed defects in the law that the inhabitants of the heavenly universe would be justified in claiming that the law could be improved? So he wanted the law changed. He emphasized that the law needed to be improved. And we'll look at that in a minute. So, when we look at the Bible, what's, what's the big questions we will tend to have about whether God kills or He doesn't kill? How does He, how, how does he uh, operate? What questions have you seen? What, what, what sticks in your mind? Flood. The flood. Okay, anything else? Battles, God's people fighting and killing. Hazza. Poor man who gathered a few sticks on the Sabbath day. Yeah. When the when, uh, uh, Bible says uh, that the uh, son of Judah was evil and the Lord smote him. Yep. Anything else? Samuel had to kill that king. Sorry? Samuel had killed that king after Saul. Refused him. Refused him. Mm hmm. Anything else? First born in Egypt. First born in Egypt. Interesting here, how God. The flood, the battles, Sodom and Gomorrah, Egypt, the laws regarding stoning. It's, this seems to be a general theme that, that we. There, there is another one too that's all you know, puzzled me as a yep. child. It's a, the law's been broken, so somebody has to die. So Jesus had to die. Mm -hmm. Story now. Story now. Yeah. Something went wrong. Someone's at fault. Yeah. And then they must be. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. One one thing that really sticks my head is, is a sermon that I've heard a, um, a pastor give. Um, and I was sitting in the pews, I was about 13 years old, been in Adventist for about a year and a half. 
And he read Ellen White's quote that Christ was so, that the weight of the world was on him so, so hard, the sins of the world were on him so hard that he was completely unrecognizable. Do you, do you remember, do you guys heard that quote before? Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the, the minister one day said, said, it pleased the father to do that to him. He had to pay the price. And it pleased him to do that to him. And as a 13-year-old kid, I went, I want none of that. I will serve you out of fright. I will serve you out of love. Yeah? Not for me. So yeah, Lister, I, I, I appreciate that comment. Yeah. It would appear that God either changed his law or God modified his law. Would that seem reasonable? We know that's impossible. We know it's impossible, okay? But it would appear that way to most of the world. Because we can't reconcile. That's right. There's a paradox coming up. Um, or we can come up to... The silent thing that's in our minds that a lot of people think but they don't verbalize, which is the law doesn't apply to him. It applies to us, but it doesn't apply to him. Yes, interesting, isn't it? Okay, we'll get back to that. So, against all biblical evidence that the law of God is his character and he changes not. Knowing that the same law that existed in heaven was written by God on earth, we look at these events and conclude that the law either has been changed to deal with, with sin or has been modified. That's the way the world looks at it. And subconsciously, I think most Christians look at, look at that that way. It does, uh, a lot of Christians that I've talked to outside Adventism and, and within Adventism they don't seem to have a problem with God burning people for eternity, forever, and ever, and ever, and ever. They don't seem to have a problem with that. Unless it's themselves. Well, yeah, not, not including themselves. I'm not going to be there, so it's all right. That's why they changed the Not only that some of them have a problem with it, they may be required to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Required. God is required to burn the unrepentant sinner. That's yeah. justice. Justice. But have we thought of the implications of that? Um, God modified his, his law, as they think, to deal with sin. Once sin has been dealt with, what does God have to do? Change, back. Change it back. But there's a problem. Because once sin has been dealt with and the law is changed back, we will live for eternity with the knowledge of what God is capable of doing. That is what will link, that's what we in our minds. This is what God is capable of doing. He's capable of changing the law, to modify the law to suit his purpose. Situational ethics. Situational ethics. Yes. And if we are in heaven with that thought, that has destroyed free will. It's a free will is an illusion. It does not exist. If he can change his mind to deal with circumstances, free will does not exist. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see if I can put it as an example. My mother told me, don't touch the fire because you'll get hurt. I touched the fire and I got hurt. And then my mother came along and said, You touch the fire, won't you got hurt? It seems I got hit for every syllable. You know, it just never stopped. So I got burnt and then I got punished for it. Assaulted. But isn't that, isn't that how we think? We are here on earth, we're subject to sin, we're subject to disease, we're, we're subject to everything. And then God comes along and says, I told you not to do this, I'm going to burn you. Because you're not accepting my salvation. That's a tyrant. Ooh, a tyrant. 
Yeah, so where have we got this, uh, this belief that either God is only keeping His law until He chooses not to do so? Where have we gotten that idea? That the law can be sub-paragraphed or it can be subjective. Where did we get that from? The world and most Christian churches don't seem to have a problem with that. <laughs> so the most of the law, most of the world would, would think, well, the law is an invention. It's to protect. Do we know that we think the law is to protect? Does the law protect? Yeah. The world thinks that the law protects too. It protects his undisputed authority. It exalts one person above everybody else. It exalts God above everybody else. One who will destroy those who have rejected him, regardless of how merciful he's become. If you reject him, you, he'll reject you and he'll kill you. And most Christians and most Adventists that you speak about this to will come up with the idea with, or the statement with, God can do whatever he wants because he is God. He is not answerable to anybody. He is God. That is the dilemma that Craig's talking about. We, there's a paradox here. How do we solve it? The easiest way to solve it is to, well, God's God. He doesn't answer to anybody. Well, we'll just walk away. But we still have that thing in our minds. Have you ever heard the terminology? Might is right. Isn't this what's happening? Might is right. Once again, where does this picture come from? It's very subtle. Um, is the change correct? Well, we know it isn't. Did God lie to us regarding His law? God cannot lie. God cannot lie. Does the law of God protect? From whom? Satan. I would think most of the world would not think that the law protects them from Satan. I think most people would say that the law protects them from God. If you keep the law, if you keep the law, then God is, is appeased. So it's actually protecting you from God. Now remember what, the, what we first said, what, what we first discussed on, on Saturday night. We are so far outside the box in our thinking that we have to come and bring it back inside the box. We're just so far out there. So is there a contradiction in Scripture? No. We have a paradox. So we need to go find the answers. As on Friday, I'll do a disclaimer. Um, my studies are heavily influenced by Adrian, Gary, F. Wright, Ellen White, biblical verses and biblical principles. And that's where most of my studies have come from. So where do we have this problem starting? Where do we have this problem starting? The character of God. Mm. Where do we have this problem with our understanding of the character of God? It began in heaven. It began in heaven. Yeah. But that's, that's where it began. But where does it come to us? Uh, the way we've been taught. Yeah? Let's go to Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. That's always the beginning. Now we don't want to, I don't want to read the whole chapter one, but I want people to tell me from chapter one what do they get of God? What picture do they get of God? Power? Power. Powerful. Anything else? I thought he was pleased with what he did. Pleased? Yep, anything else? His life. Anything else? He likes beautiful things. Beautiful things. More things, more things. Everything. Everything. He likes making living things. Okay, he makes living things. What 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 do we just love? When 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 you look at a forest, right? Have you ever looked at a forest? And that happened to me when I was in camp once. I looked at the forest and I saw maybe seven or eight different shades of green. So, would you say that God's creative? <laughs> At the very least. I 
Artistic. It's creative, artistic. He loves variety. Loves variety. I also wonder if he made the sky red. Made us? Would we love it as much as it is blue? Yes. Well, I, I heard the scientists talk about that. If the, if the sky was any other colour than blue, we wouldn't be able to see. It would just affect us so much we would have headaches. We would, and I don't know if it's true or not, but that's a comment to him. But yeah, it was interesting. Anything else? Is it God? That's an image. That's an image, yes. Is it God of order? God, God of order. So all of these things he has made. And he has made all of those things for himself, right? Well, no. He took, pleasure. <laughs> he took pleasure. But who did he make them for? Adam and Eve. So he's a giving God. He can't help but create something and give it. Share it. Yes? Alright. Alright, this time we'll go to Genesis chapter 2 and start reading. Uh, Craig, would you mind start reading in chapter 2, verses 1, and we'll just keep continuing. And thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts. And on the seventh day God entered his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord... God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. The Lord God planted a garden east of the Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God, oh, out, out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Halima, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is yet and fine stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that can pass up the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Yildikau, that is it which goes towards the east of Assyria, and the fourth river is Euphrates. Through to 16, please. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in that day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely go on. Okay, let's stop there. So in those first 16 verses, what do you get out of those first 16 verses? Um, is, is, is God caring? How much, does, how much does God care? Yeah, he looked, he looked at Adam, and what, what was the first thought he, he when he looked at Adam? What, what, he, what the first thought he had? Yeah, it's not good for him to be alone. No, I wouldn't have thought that. I would have said, "Whoa, look what I did!" But God thinks, "Whoa, he, he, it's no good to him to him be alone." And I don't know whether you have ever kissed dust, but it doesn't taste very good. Now I've fallen on my face riding a bike and it doesn't t- taste well, but he is on his knees, he moulds and, and he breathes into his lips life. So he's caring, he's loving, he's not selfish. He makes things for to share with people, to, to make things to share with, with the, the creatures he has created. And what does God want in return? Because here we have to separate this. Is it Eros or is it Agape? What does God want in return? Yes. 
Amen. God back. Yeah. All God wants is, can you imagine Adam waking up and saying, hello, and God saying, you're my son. Yeah? I created him. Well, what do I do? Just follow me. Do exactly as I do. Fall in love with me. Fall in love with my character. Follow me. I've given you everything. This is all yours. You do the same. When you have children, you'll do the same. Go out and multiply. Follow my example. So all God wants is for us to fall in love with His character because of who He is, to be like Him, to freely and lovingly do exactly what He does. And what does God do freely and lovingly? Give. Give. He, wants, he wants God's people to serve. Didn't Christ came and served? That's why God asked him to do what with the animals? Nice Give them names. You know? well, they're lost. Yep. Give them names. They're yours. And to do what with the ground? Till it. Till it. Make something grow. So he lovingly wants us to want Adam, Adam and Eve to follow his example. God gave them full liberty to choose. He gave them full liberty to choose. To choose what? Whether, it's or not. Whether you're in love with my character or not. Pat, in Ellen White wrote in Eternity Pages, Eternity's Past, page 19. Our first parents, though created innocent and holy, were not placed beyond the possibility of wrongdoing. God made them free moral agents with the liberty to yield or to withhold obedience. So what does that mean if you're giving free, if you're giving liberty to yield or to withhold obedience? Yeah, there can't be any, any restrictions. You either you have had liberty to do it, or you don't. There's no restrictions here. So an opportunity was given to them to be able to demonstrate liberty, to yield what we hold of obedience by placing the tree of knowledge of good and evil where did he put the tree of good and evil? In the garden. Where in the garden? In the midst of it. So they didn't have to go to a back corner somewhere. It's in the midst. Next to what? The tree of life. Both within reach. I'll ask you a question, and there's a lot of Bible scholars here who will know a lot more than me. What is the tree of knowledge of good and evil? What is it? It's just a tree. Just a tree. Anybody else? Anything else? It's, it's a test? Okay, let's say it's a test. Anything else? Anybody else has an idea? I thought it was there for the protection. It was there for the protection. Okay. Well, it was uh, given to give them the opportunity to exercise their free will. Mm -hmm. Because if you have no choices to make, you'd, well, what's the point of being free will? Okay. It was the only place that Satan could tempt them. Mm -hmm. Good. So whatever you think it was, or it is, whatever you think it was, one thing for sure that we know about the truth is that it was not theirs. Everything else was theirs. Everything else was given to them to eat. But the tree was not theirs. Whose who's, who's was the tree? God was the tree. He created it. It was His. And He told them, don't eat from the tree or you will die. Is that making sense? Or are you ready to throw tomatoes at me? <laughs> Good, making sense? It's my tree. It, well, it's not like that, but that's that's the test that God said. Now, this is all yours. You can have whatever you want, but this is mine. Don't eat from this. All the other trees, the fruits, they could eat and rejoice in the blessings of God. 
but the tree was his. If they could respect the fact that the tree is God's and had reserved by God for a reason, then you know, we had a lot of we would have gotten rid of a lot of problems. The Sabbath day. Who is the Lord of the Sabbath? But the, the Sabbath was made for. When do we have a problem with the Sabbath day? When we think that we are the Lord of the Sabbath. That the Sabbath belongs to us. And we can change it, we can modify it, we can do this, we can't we don't do that. But the Sabbath day is the Lord's for us. And if the tree belonged to God mm -hmm. and they took the fruit, were they not guilty of stealing? <laughs> they were guilty of stealing. They were guilty of lots of things. One of them was stealing. You know? um, they covered it. They, they covered it. So there, that seems to be an issue that I want you to have to think about. It was not theirs. And they broke the law by stealing, coveting the tree. Because there was nothing wrong. Was there anything wrong with the, with the fruit? No, there was nothing wrong with the fruit. It was the principle that God had put there, don't eat it or you will die. Okay. If they would have respected that, then they truly would have been content with his character. He has given us everything but that. I'm content with that. They would have been content with everything God had given to them. And they would have been content with the position God had given to them. Does it start sounding familiar? About someone who was not content with the position that God had given to him? That was not content with God's character? But they were tempted and they disrespected everything that we just spoke about. Genesis 2.17. Can we read that again, please? So Lester talked about this today and made a very important point. point. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. What does that miss out? What is it not saying? In the day you eat of it, I will kill you. I will kill you. Is, is it saying that? No. I will destroy you. Is it saying, on the day you eat it, I will do everything possible to win you back, but when I can't win you back, you're dead. Does it say that? But it doesn't say the other either. You will live forever. It doesn't say, it says death, but it's not clear. And that's why people say, well, God's going to kill them. How do we get to that point? How do we know God's not going to kill them? I put it through. I put put it to you guys, like we discussed this morning about Job. Sometimes we look at things and we put our own interpretation on things. Where Job was quite clear that he did not attribute all the, but these bad things to God. He did not attribute them. But we read Job, and the majority of, of, of the world would say, "Well, God did this to me." But Job didn't feel that that way. He knew. He lived it. So he knew it wasn't God. So how did Adam and Eve feel? How, how, what was their understanding of, of death, that they would die? It does not say that God will kill them. But it does not say that he would not kill them. Did they even know what death was? They chose to I'm getting controversial here, aren't I? Yeah. Is, could, could you say that at that point, God cannot sustain them anymore? God cannot keep them. <coughs> cannot, they cannot be in His presence. So His love and life-giving presence cannot sustain them anymore. They will start to decay. Is that, is that what they believed? Or is that what we believe looking back and all and everything we have read biblically and all? Is What did they actually believe? They probably thought they were going to die. The clue is actually... In the verses that are coming along, because they didn't want to be, they didn't want to go. <coughs> There's only two interpretations of these verses. Mm -hmm. It's either God's going to kill them, or 
sins that, or, or sin's going to kill them. There's no other interpretation. Either God's going to kill them or, or something else is going to kill them, or they're going to die. So what do they understand? What do they understand that it mean? Did they think God was going to kill them or was it going to be a result of eating the fruit, eating of sin? There was a reason they hid the garden. Sorry? There was a reason they hid the garden. Yes, but that came later. <laughs> <laughs> so let's have a look at the rest of the dialogue. That gives us a clue, or gives us an understanding on how they read the statement, Eat us therefore, thereof, thou shalt surely die. Who instigated the conversation? Like, let's, sorry, let's, let's go to chapter 3. Let's go to chapter 3, verse 1, and we'll read that through. Um, now, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, We shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, You may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, and you shall not touch it, lest you die. Can we keep reading? Okay. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Through the verse, end of verse 6, please. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he. Back to the original question. Who instigated the conversation? Who said that? And what does he say? Questions whether God has really said. Mm -hmm. Well, he asked what he meant to do. Sorry, can you explain that, please? Yes. He, he says, um, Hath God said, mm -hmm. Shall you not eat of every tree of God? <coughs> He's encouraging you to eat of the truth. Okay. God has said you can eat of every truth. Yep. So Lucifer comes and instigates the conversation. Does Lucifer ever come to uphold God? Does Lucifer ever come to uphold God's law? Does he ever come to uphold his character? Then the rest of the conversation will tell us where he is leading Eve. So he instigates the conversation. So he starts putting doubt into her mind. He is starting to work on something. He is leading her. We would say that he is leading the witness. But he is leading her somewhere. He is suggesting to her that God does his mean what he says. Yep, he does. But we'll get there. There's also another thing that we need to we need to look at before we read verse two and three. Ellen White says that Eve had thoughts about the tree before. She soon found herself gazing with mingled curiosity and admiration upon the, fo the forbidden tree. The fruit was beautiful, and she questioned why God had will withheld it from them. So is she starting to question? Now, is questioning a sin? No. no. How do we know questioning not a sin? Because the command was when you eat. Not the question. Might have been wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, did Christ question? Yeah. If this cup uh, would be passed from me, that's a question. Do you see? No, it was just a simple question. He had, he had a question. She has a question. But it would have been appropriate for Eve to go to God and the next to have a visit and ask those questions. Yeah, and then definitely. The you would have told her, look, you can eat of everything, <laughs> but of this tree, you can't because you'll die. Mm -hmm. And if she really understood God's character, she'd go, okay, that, that's fine. Yeah. By faith, yeah. I accept that. By faith. So she has a question on it. Now let's read verse 2 and 3. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of 
fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. What has he just done? She's added. She's added. Okay. What's what's the what's Eve's biggest problem here? What's the biggest problem? Well, she's given Satan a perfect opportunity. Okay. Sure. The biggest problem is she didn't run. She was away from her husband. She was away from her head. And she and she started a conversation. With Lucifer. Sorry. I remember reading that she had a, when she realized she was away from her husband, she had a thought of, oh, I'm not supposed to be great. Oh, I'm okay. I'll, I'll get a handle. Mm -hmm. So that was the first problem, is that she thought that she's going to handle it. Why do I need a man out of the also, you've got to realize how Lucifer, how the serpent came to her. Um, Ellen White writes, The serpent continued with subtle praises of her surpassing loveliness, and, it, and his words were not un, it was not displeasing. Instead of fleeing from the spot, she lingered. She had no thought that the fascinating serpent could be the medium of the fallen, fallen foe. So Lucifer was very, very clever. As he, as he is. Right? What, did he, what, what did he touch on? Her yeah, surpassing her beauty, flattery. Yeah. Flattery. flattery. Then we all love a bit of flattery. She's already thinking, like Laurel said, that you know, she can handle this. And Lucifer's saying, well, you're a beautiful person. You know, yeah, why should you be held back from this? So it's just these, these ideas start coming forward. And had Lucifer done had Lucifer done this before? Didn't, didn't we read that he said the angels didn't have to keep the law? Why shouldn't they have to keep the law? Because they were holy. They were beautiful. Verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Is Lucifer implying something here? Yes and no. <laughs> the no part is, he's not implying anything. He's saying that God is a liar, straight out. And then the implications come in. This is a direct attack on what? On the character of God. On the law. God had said that dis disobedience to the law would lead to death. Satan says that you can break the law without any consequences. God is a liar. He is not what you think he is. He plants doubt into her mind that God has an ulterior motive to telling them that they would not die. What is the ulterior motive? He doesn't want to become like him. Doesn't want them to become like him? Yeah. He's holding them back from a higher existence. He's holding them back from a hard existence. Isn't what the law in heaven? Weren't the angels being held back from a bettering, better existence? Wasn't the law arbitrary? Didn't the law need to be changed? Wasn't he trying to encourage them that there was a better way of doing things? Verse 5. So here is very plain as to what he's trying to say. You are being held back. He knows that when you eat these, you will know, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Did he lie to her? <coughs> Does God know good and evil? Yes. No. No. <laughs> he's seen it. He's seen it. So... Mm, what does it mean to know? To experience. To experience. 
So I think that was part of the lie, is that God really doesn't know evil. He, 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 can, he, he knows what it is, he, 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 can, he has observed it, he knows what, would, what the outcome would be, but he himself has not personally experienced it. Sorry? Why didn't it use the word experience, or does that word knowing mean experience? Um, to me, knowing is that personal relationship. Something that you know for certain because you've experienced it. But I stand corrected. You know, to, to me, it's, like I said, it's just a study. So I'm quite happy to put my hand up and say I'm wrong. Um, but it could be acquainted. Acquainted. Mm. Okay. So Lucifer's telling them that God is holding them back. That the law is an invention or a system that God uses to maintain his position and power. How do we know that? that? Because his reference is that you will be like God. So he is telling you not to eat this, so you will not be like God. So he's protecting his own position and power. But that's exactly what Lucifer wanted, was to be like God. But now he's trying to put into her the same issues that he had. Yes. Yep, exactly. And not only does he say that, he says that God knows that if you eat from the tree, you would, be re you would receive empowerment to be God. And, and, and Adrian talks about this in Identity Wars, that there's certain objects that you can grab to make you powerful. And this is what Lucifer is telling you, her. this is an object that you can grab to make you powerful and you will be like God. He uses the law to stop someone ascending to an equal position of himself. Does that sound familiar? This is what he's telling her. He's stopping you from being gods. He's also saying that God knows about it and he's lied to you just to keep you in, subje in subjection. He invented the lie that if you ate from the tree of Tree, you would die. The tree has not harm. Is the tree was not harmful to eat or to touch. After all, wasn't he touching the tree? Who said that he couldn't touch the tree? Eve. Eve. Now we're going to go to the point of the whole, <laughs> of this whole study. What is Lucifer asking Eve to do? He's asking Eve to interpret what God has said and modify it. She thinks it's for a good cause. What does the Bible say about not a dot, not a hand? He's, he's encouraging her to start interpreting God's word. Can you see that? Not only is what God said, but she's adding to it. God had invented the law to to safeguard his own position. God had failed in his attempt to deceive them regarding the eating and the touching of the tree. Death would be the only way that God could hold them back. And that could only come at his hands. After all, they were touching the tree and they weren't dying. So if by touching the tree they weren't dying, how could they die? God would have to intervene. That's the only way that they could die. From these verses comes the surrender of humanity to the enemy. Satan is given a role that he, had, he was never assigned to. A role he was already acquainted with, though God never assigned it to him. In a sense, he has become like the Most High. Patriarchs and Prophets. Page 40, paragraph 3. Many were disposed to heed this counsel, to repent. This, sorry, this is talking about the angels. Many were disposed to heed this counsel, to repent of their dissatisfaction, and seek to be again received into favor with the Father and His Son. But Lucifer had another deception ready. The mighty revolter, oh, what a word, <laughs> the mighty revolter, now declared that the angels who had united with him had gone too far to return, that he was acquainted with the divine law and knew that God would not forgive. 
What does he just become to the angels? He is the interpreter of God's law to the angels. They could have bypassed him, but they accepted his interpretation. He declared that all who would submit to the authority of heaven would be stripped of their honor, degraded from their position. For himself, he was determined never again to acknowledge the authority of Christ. The only cause remaining for him and his followers, he said, was to assert their liberty and gain by force the rights which had not been willingly accorded to them. So in, in heaven, Lucifer becomes the interpreter of God's word, and they accept it. What happened in the Garden of Eden? What happened in the Garden of Eden? Lucifer says, that's sure, thou shalt not die. So humanity gives the interpretation of God's words to his enemy. And we have not recovered since. Yeah. Because as he did with Eve, Lucifer doesn't care if he's the only one that interprets God's word. If humanity can interpret God's word, he's fine with that. Because what's our carnal hearts? Enmity. How are we going to interpret God's, God's word? Without the Holy Spirit. Without Without the character of Christ, without the Holy Spirit, we will not get His word right. So does He care? Nope. Just as long as we don't go to God and say, Lord, show me what this means. Clarify this for me. The argument is repeated on earth. And with, and with this conversation with the saint becomes an interpreter of God's words and their meanings. They accepted his interpretation of thou shalt not die and partook of the fruit with the, with the interpretation that by breaking the law does not mean that you will die. That's his interpretation. You can avoid death and you can actually become gods. And since then God has been working constantly to restore us. How? Without changing his law He's continually tried to restore us, without changing his character. Yet through it all, Satan has continued to offer himself as the interpreter for God's actions and his words. Doesn't Helen White say that Lucifer tries to impart his character onto God? Isn't that the interpretation that we grab onto? Who is a murderer from the beginning? Lucifer. But we are quite willing to say that God will be a, a murderer at the end. So how has God tried to work? How has God tried to restore it? I speak that which I have seen with my Father. So who's speaking? And ye do that which ye have seen of your Father. God sent the only being in the whole of the universe who can interpret his character. The only begotten Son of the Father. There's nobody else in the universe who can clearly interpret his character. Because he is the image of God. The clearest actions that the interpretation has been influenced by Lucifer is... Should they have known that Christ was coming? Should they have known Christ was coming? Why didn't they? <coughs> You're talking about Israelites. Yeah, Israelites. Why didn't they accept Christ? Someone else interpreted it. Their interpretation was wrong. I wonder who led them to, the, to get their <coughs> interpretation. We have a problem with who is, who is actually interpreting God's word for us if we are dependent on the church, if we are dependent on our own thoughts. We can only be dependent on who? The Holy Spirit, which is Christ, the only one who can truly interpret the character of God for us. This has clouded our understanding of many things. 
including the character of God. And tomorrow we will look at how it has clouded and why it has been clouded. That's it. I hope that is challenging. <laughs> and you have lots of questions and call me at the back and say, You heretic! <laughs> but share, share whatever, you, whatever your thoughts are. I'm showing you. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful that you have sent us your Son, that he died for our sins, that you raised him, Lord, and that through him we can have an understanding of who you really are. Lord, we have been given a wrong interpretation, a wrong definition of who you are, and these ideas have been going on for centuries, and they are stuck in our heads, Lord. We need our thoughts rewritten. We need our hearts rewritten. And Lord, we pray that you continue to teach us, you continue to lead us as we earnestly desire to get closer to you and to really understand who our Father is and who his Son is. So thank you for your grace and mercy in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.